Miller. On this episode of Tiger Turf Talk, we host Nancy Berlin, extension agent for the state of Virginia in Prince William County, focusing on master gardeners. In this episode, we discuss so many different aspects of what it takes to become a master gardener. Um, it was such a great opportunity for our students to hear a different side of what our community is like and what Mrs. Berlin does for our community as a whole when it comes to working with volunteers who are, have an interest and are interested in environmental aspects uh, from horticulture, arboriculture, uh, turf management, all these different things that really have such a big role in our community. Um, and to have our students hear from someone who has had such a lasting impact over the years here in Prince William County, it was such a great opportunity for our students to learn. We had a great time talking with her. We cannot thank her enough. And again, just being able to see through her work, whether it's working on community gardens where the yield goes to food, uh, food shelters and other different places that are in need in our community and how we can make a lasting impact on things like uh, the watershed and everything that we have here in Prince William County Schools and really with everything that we can create through our work and for our students to be a part of it. Uh, we're really looking forward to partnering with uh, the Master Gardeners and moving forward and creating that opportunity for our students to thrive in a setting here in Prince William County uh, in so many different avenues. So we can't thank her enough again. Um, kids had a blast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tiger Turf Talk. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 29th episode of Tiger Turf Talk. I'm your host, Drew Miller, with your co-host, Mara Brooks. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Miss uh, Nancy Berlin, uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension Specialist in Prince William County with Master Gardeners. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks. It's spring. Uh, that is, we're getting there, you know, and I, I can't stand this time because I was talking with the kids today. It's you get there, it's 30, and you have everything on, and then you got to take the jacket off at like 10 o'clock and take the hoodie off around 12 o'clock, and then you're just sweating and <laughs> never fun. Um, but yes, spring is coming, thank goodness. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. We're so excited to talk to you, uh, especially being local and everything. Um, we sort of just wanted to get into uh, what you do, uh, sort of what your role is uh, with Master Gardeners and how it sort of... Uh, in your career you've been around for a while i do remember meeting you when i was in college at virginia tech um and it just fascinates me what you do and who you work with so if you could sort of speak to what your your role is and how you it's developed over the years i'd love to um the master gardener program um is my main responsibility but i also serve the community directly um so I manage 203 Master Gardener volunteers and um, train them, um, kind of help them along finding their niche, uh, finding the place that they'll, they'll shine and where they'll enjoy volunteering, help them along with continuing education and keep, keep managing all the projects that we have going on. Um, and then I serve as outreach for the community when we were open before COVID, we would have a lot of walk-ins, people wanting to know what to do with their soil, how to compost, what was wrong with their tomato, uh, how, to, how to handle their lawn, you know, everything just from, um, it just wide variety of topics. And then I do some public speaking in the community with, you know, groups that invite me and we do site visits to schools to set up gardens. So, so it's, a, it's never dull. And it's uh, quite a varied job. And I get to spend a lot of time outside, which is nice. What is your educational background and how is it, has it prepared you for your current role with Virginia Tech? Well, you're gonna laugh, Mara, because I started um, in healthcare. I started as a speech pathologist and then I went and got my master's in audiology. Then I had kids and did some consulting and then um, I went back to a private practice and started working. 
and decided I needed a doctorate if I wanted to continue in audiology, fitting hearing aids and testing babies' hearing and stuff. And so I applied and got accepted in a doctoral program. And then I went to an extension social event, a, a picnic. And somebody said, you know, we, uh, we have this opening coming up in our office we think you'd be good for. So I applied for it and I got the job. And I sent all my books back for my doctorate and never looked back. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled um, that this is the path that I was led to. And, and since then I've gotten, you know, some, a certificate with Virginia Tech and stuff. So I've built up my resume in, in the natural resource area, but it was a circuitous path, path certainly. I, lo I love it because a lot of people, it is sort of, uh, you kind of find it, you know, it's not really a planned out uh, process or anything. Um, so, and I've met you through Dr. Goatley down at Virginia Tech, and I believe he's worked with you on certain things with Master Gardeners. Um, with your position at, with extension for the state of Virginia, could you play, uh, could you explain, I'm sorry, explain how you play a key role in sort of stewardship of all things environmental uh, with plants and everything else that goes into it? Sure. Yeah. Dr. Goatley is the best. Um, he is a great man. He plus turf. I mean, where are you going to find that combination anywhere else? I don't know if you've heard their band, the turf department band play. <laughs> it is incredible. I've, I've seen it. Yes. It he, is hilarious. He is a hoot. Yes. He, he make he just makes everything so much fun, you know? Yeah. Um, even turf. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I guess I feel like it's a pretty big responsibility to talk to people who are so detached from the natural world about being sustainable. Uh, you know, uh, e e adults and kids alike, you know, don't go outside as much as they used to. They don't know common plants. They don't know how soil works. And so that you know, I think just getting that word out and teaching sustainability to every age group, you know, our focus is mainly adults, but I, I just feel that's a huge responsibility and to have 200 volunteers that are helping me do that is such a pleasure. So I, I don't know if that answered your question fully. It did. Okay. <laughs> Can you explain what the process is to achieve the title, mas the title of Master Gardener? Sure. So there's Master Gardener programs all over the United States, you know, so um, and they're all a little different. You know, we try to meet the needs of our community. So um, in our program, which is slightly different from Fairfax and Fauquier and all the surrounding counties, uh, we have about 20 uh, sick six uh, classes. We meet twice a week um, from September through December. It's pretty intense. And um, those classes will range everywhere from the, you know, beginning botany uh, to flower dissection to uh, plant pathology labs where they have to look at samples and figure out what to do. So they take these classes, they take quizzes, they take a final exam. But because we're older, we allow them to do open book for everything because we don't rely on our memory anymore. And, and, and I have adults that, I, that are, you know, 20 somethings all the way up to a 90 year old. So, um, and then after that classwork is complete and they pass their exam and um, then they do a 50 hour internship for during the year. On a non-COVID year, it takes a year or less. <laughs> it's a little more challenging now. And then, then after that, they become a, a master gardener and they have to do 20 hours of service minimum and have eight hours of continuing it per year. And most of them do much more than that. So you were sort of speaking with COVID. How has that impacted you? Because I know with education, obviously a lot of people know like virtual setting. That's how this all started um, and we actually discussed with a couple different groups that were asking about, uh, gardens, trying to build them in communities and whatnot, um, with the program coming and helping build them. 
Um, how is that? How has COVID sort of impacted everything with you and Master Gardeners in Prince William? Oh, it's been a drastic change. And in some ways, it's been real hard. And other ways, we've learned some things that I don't think we would have learned any other way. Um, all of our public classes have been online since last March. And we've, we've seen an exponential increase in attendance at those. Um, all the way, I mean, sometimes we've maxed out Zoom. We usually get at least 100 people for each class, some from as far as away as Sweden. <laughs> um, you know, so um, having that virtual platform and be able to offer that to such a wide range and diverse group of people um, has been incredibly rewarding. Um, so that, that has been a really good thing. Um, Master Gardener training was virtual this year too. And I had hoped to do some in-person stuff, but as things got worse with COVID, um, I scaled that back and tried to figure out ways to, um, that we could do hands-on things uh, without being face-to-face. -face. So we did dissection over Zoom. We did plant pathology labs over Zoom with breakout rooms. We tried to incorporate all the problem solving and higher level thinking skills um, into a virtual atmosphere. I, at the beginning, I packed up all these kits and I had them pick the kits up so that they, they would have everything they'd need to do some soil um, experiments at home um, and, and uh, some flowers to dissect and some seeds to, to plant and germinate, look, looking at monocots and dicots. So they had a little packet of goodies uh, with all their curriculum material too. So, and then as far as community activities go, we've just kind of had to tiptoe into this um, slowly as things change, but we're planning on doing some face-to-face -face stuff this spring and summer um, if all goes well. Here's hoping because I am yeah. at the end of my rope with this stuff, you know. I'm uh, sure. <laughs> um, over the years and I've seen it over either social media or through Virginia Tech. Um, you guys have done different projects and developed different things in the area, um, whether it's community gardens that and you end up donating the yield to uh, food shelter, whatever shelters or anywhere that you've sort of developed new things. Could you sort of discuss the different projects that you have developed for master gardeners to sort of educate, but also benefit those around you? Yeah, and I, I think that's the key, um, Andrew, for, for keeping volunteers interested to have a diversity of projects, you know, that get at what they want to do. So we've done uh, tree planting with our watershed branch and uh, monitoring that those tree planting so, so that the county doesn't have to mow, mow those areas anymore or take care of any turf grass in that area. Plus it you know, gives a canopy for storm water and uh, better carbon sequestration, certainly. Um, the food pantry gardens, we work with a couple communities in, in lower income areas to help them plant um, and get started on a food, you know, planting food for their community to share. Um, with, and those, those have been successful. You know, I'm never sure each year if it's going to go again, <laughs> but um, we have about, I'm, we've been active in, you know, 75 to 80 school gardens and they're in various shapes, shapes of repair right now. Um, some of them are re really looking good. Some of them are just newly getting off the ground. So we have, a, you know, a lot of input in that. Um, we give some grants for school gardens since I've started to. Um, we helped with the healing garden at the hospital. We got called in to help with native plant selection for that. We ended up planting the whole garden um, at Novant. And then um, the teaching garden, of course, is a great outdoor classroom that takes a lot of upkeep, you know, a couple thousand hours every year for volunteers. We designed and planted a garden at the Manassas uh, Historic Site Liberia House. Uh, we were at we're usually at garden centers, uh, but we're going to be at farmer's markets answering people's questions that come by. Um, 
We've done scout programs, help with seed libraries. You know, I try to say yes when people ask. And if I, with the caveat, I, if I can find the right volunteer, I, you know, then we'd love to help you. So it's never dull. <laughs> it's always ex exciting. So you kind of already touched on this, but can you speak to your passion for plants and how you have made such a successful career for your love of gardening and help those in our community? Sure. It's, it's really a blessing to be able to work with plants. And I always say I have to have a lot of plants in my yard because you have to have a plant to know a plant. You know, when it looks different when it's a seedling than it looks like when it's a mature plant. And so that's my excuse for having lots and lots and lots of plants in my yard, including a meadow in my front and backyard. Um, and my neighbors don't care, which is nice. Um, so just being able to uh, have plants myself and, you know, my yard teaches me something every day when I go out. So I have to make time to do that. And the critters that live in the soil and, and um, that benefit from a habitat in my yard are also always teaching me. So it, it's really fun to, to, to do that, but it's even more fun to share it with people who like plants too, because plant people are kind of special. <laughs> We're all plant nerds, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and what we are all too, you know, if we're in this program, yeah, we gotta great. be right. Um, so with master gardeners, what are you aiming to educate? Obviously you have the curriculum and everything, but what is your goal with that education for the members that, again, it comes with a, like a cost. You have to pay a certain amount of, I don't know what the total is, but in order to be a part of the program, there's an upfront cost and it's not much, I don't think, but what is it that you're aiming to sort of educate your I guess students is the right word, um, when they actually achieve their certification? That's a really good question. The, the class costs my cost. It costs $245. The manual is 80. That's absolutely um, nothing. That sucks up a lot of the funds there. And then I, I pay some of our instructors who are professionals an honorarium. And then we give them about 12 different books. Um, plus, um, you know, some refreshments every now and then and some tools like, like hand lenses and stuff. Gotcha. The goal for teaching them, you know, one of our classes, I take them to the stream and we do some stream ecology. We collect some macroinvertebrates, some of the little critters that live under the leaf litter in the stream. We talk about health of stream and what makes a stream healthy and what um, impacts uh, a stream negatively. And you know what, that's the main, that is the main thing I want to, them to understand that everything they do and everything they teach citizens to do in their yards affects water quality. And so I say, I usually get in the stream with my hip boots and I say, this is the whole reason for the Master Gardener program. Water quality, the water we drink, the, the water we can use for recreation, uh, the water that our, uh, you know, our plants need and the health of that. And all of our streams are impaired, you know, and so keeping them either at that level or improving them, that's the goal of the Master Gardener program, water quality. That's the basics. Absolutely. Um, with most certifications and like you, you've already discussed, there's continuing education after you have obtained it, whether it's, uh, master gardener whether it's a uh, fertilizer license and it's really not even just when we talk about environmental things uh there's always continuing education can you sort of discuss the importance of again not just with master gardeners but in continuing education for those that work with plants and the environment from arborists turf managers and so much more um again just how significant it is to have that continuing education that's so true you know, when I started in this job 14 years ago, we, things were so different. We, <laughs> weeds were the enemy. I mean, they still are kind of. <laughs> um, pesticides were, were recommended without notice. Um, and, and now things are um, 
you know, least toxic alternative is important. Um, using pesticides as a last resort or any chemicals. Weeds can be a nectar and pollen source for insects that are out early and, um, and need them. And so, you know, continuing it, just continuing to evolve in the profession for any of you that are contemplating the horticulture field um, is so important because things change all the time. There's so little we know really about the natural world. And you guys may be the ones to find that because um, sometimes after you've been in the field for a while, you, you don't look at things quite as carefully. But young, young people will come up with a question that maybe we've never even thought about. And so having that continuing education is critically important. Plus it sparks new ideas in, in even older master gardeners' minds so that they, they can explore um, a topic that they may not have known they were even interested in. So many of them come to class and go, you know, I really didn't think I was going to like turf and I didn't think I was going to want to hear about soils, but boy, those were the most interesting classes. <laughs> or one lady was like, I really want to get into worm composting. And I'm like, you know, that was not what I was expecting from this older woman to say, you know. And so she went on to teach kids about worm composting for about a year. And then she said, I'm done with worms. I want to move on to trees. You know? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, I think being a lifelong learner is just the way to go. And I can't encourage you guys enough to keep learning. Absolutely. I love how you said evolved because it, it truly is just ever changing. And, and I mean, it, if it's technology, if it's something else, there's always something new coming around the corner. And again, with the continued education, it is critical. Um, so thank you for that saying that. Um, Sort of with the continuing education, sort of continued on that, like we've already discussed with Dr. Goatley, who else are you working with? Um, and you sort of discussed how you sometimes pay professionals to come and help. Uh, who else are you working with specifically uh, with the, the Prince William County community and sort of other professionals in our area? You know, it takes a long time to build those relationships. You know, and you know, as when you started, you, you know, getting connected to the community is really important and face-to-face -face, um, interaction is really important. So it's taken about 14 years and I really feel like we have a solid team in this county. So we work with the watershed branch who funds us partially and the, the county arborist is in there and the engineers and um, there's been back and forth training. Um, I'm taking the Chesapeake Bay landscape professional training. So that's helping me understand what stormwater people do better. Um, we work with Prince William Conservation Alliance. They are a fantastic group that, that um, does more political and we can't get into that, you know, being county employees and state employees, but they can, they can advocate for po political statements and um, we work with Prince William Wildflower Society um, regularly. We, we lecture for them. They come and lecture for us. We have joint, joint speakers come in, um, you know, and, and Lions Clubs have helped us fund projects. We've worked with um, retirement communities to put in um, um, native trees and also rain gardens uh, at, at Westminster at Lake Ridge. Um, and then some, some businesses, honestly, you know, we partner with Maryfield and Southern States and Lowe's to do clinics at their stores because we want people to have the right information. We don't want to sell a product. We want them to have, you know, correct information and not just make money off of it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, partnerships are everything. And and I just, I feel really proud of, of the way that those relationships have developed, but it's taken time and people have to trust you. Yep, exactly. And I, 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 again, from a distance, because I mean, since I was in college and knowing about the relationship sort of with Goatley and everything that I've learned, you, you've grown so much since I was a freshman in college back in, oh, geez, when was that? 
I think it was 2014. Um, but mm. again, like there's so much, so many good things that you're doing. And I, I truly appreciate it being, uh, again, even if it's just turf, being a, an environmentalist and everything. So it's mm. incredible what you do. Um, Thank you. With that, I am curious. Um, obviously, we're sort of discussing sort of funding and everything and trying to, again, you have to make money in order to develop the program and everything. How are you recruiting people? Um, and with the cost that it is, and again, it's absolutely nothing when you look at it face value versus mm. what I paid for, for all the landscaping, horticulture, turf classes I took in college, you know, um, mm -hmm. what is it that you're sort of doing to recruit, uh, sort of this educational portion again, sometimes seen as a hobby. Sometimes it develops even more than that. Um, even in your story, um, how have you been able to recruit these people and what kind of people are a part of this program that again, retain even more people further down the line? That's a really good question. And we were just talking about that last night. We had a meeting with, um, over a hundred of our volunteers on zoom. And so we, rec I recruit differently than I did when I first started. I was kind of meek when I first started, but um, now I'm looking to expand the diversity. Honestly, we have a lot of white middle-aged females and what we want to do is have young, old, all different, you know, backgrounds and cultures, black and brown, you know, Asian. We, we really want to have a diverse community of environmental educators. And so we're going to, I just was talking about that last night to the group. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, aim to increase our diversity over the coming year. And I'm gonna meet with um, them for some brainstorming. Um, but we actually have the last two classes of Master Gardeners have been more diverse than we've ever had before as far as ethnically. And, and that's been really good for our program. There have been things that I would have never learned if, if, you know, with another group of people, but vegetables, cultural, you know, cultural um, farming, that techniques that I'd never known before. And so, and, and we've started sponsoring more um, diverse speakers. We had um, Ira Wallace come and talk with us from Southern Exposure Seed. We had Michael Carter come from the Carter Farms in VSU. But and the cost is something. I mean, $240 is a lot of money still. And um, we give scholarships through our, our 501c3 association. That's uh, for class. And it's either a full or a partial scholarship. And we'd like to increase that. I had a master gardener today say, I can't, you know, I can't go to the convention this year, but I want to give you some money toward a scholarship. So, um, and Advertising on social media has brought in a lot more diversity too. Um, and, and advertising in Hispanic newspapers as we can. We can't offer the class in Spanish right now because we just don't have the personnel that are fluent. But um, so, so that's our goal with recruiting. And uh, I haven't had any trouble bringing in numbers the last few years. Uh, we know we've had full classes pretty much, um, but I would like them to be more diverse. Yes, so how would an individual benefit from obtaining the certification that requires over 50 hours of work to obtain the certification? Is it similar to a teacher obtaining a teacher's license? Yeah, I always say it's like college level instruction. And, you know, and you guys are used to studying for tests, right? <laughs> but but <laughs> these adults come back and they're like, I have my PhD and I got a D on this quiz, you know? Um, and so um, it, I, th I think it really does benefit them because it's a, it's a wide range of uh, learning styles that I present, some hands-on, you know, some problem solving, uh, some, some visual, some auditory. Uh, and so um, I think that benefits adults to learn in different manners. And I think it, um, Helps them be sympathetic to what you all are going through as far as learning. Um, I, th I think it's a good program. And I think the Fairfax program is excellent too. Um, they, offer, they offer 
a lot more variety in their training classes than we do in a two-year program. So I think it's a great deal for $240, but I recognize also that some people need help with that. And I'm happy to provide that. Um, I, I think it's a great stepping off point if you wanna go into the horticultural field. I've had landscape architects take the training. Uh, recently, one of our students went on to get the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional uh, Certification Level One, and she's off making her own business now. Um, doing stormwater visits. So, you know, I, that's not my goal is to train professionals, but I'm happy if people go on to use that training um, in a profession. I love how you talked about how people who are in the industry are using your training. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And sort of to go along with that, um, can you sort of discuss different avenues you've seen your students take uh, beyond the master gardener after obtaining it. And obviously they're still working. You said they have to do 20 hours a year. Are there any other programs that they look into to even further their education, uh, whether it's college, whether it's going into uh, a different sort of uh, extension program? Have you, ever, have you seen different programs and could you sort of explain what they are to the kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that first Stephanie that went on to do the Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, um, but also, um, you know, we've had people that work work at um, big garden centers, big well-known garden centers, and they came to class and said, you know, I said, I did an exit interview with them, and I said, well, what'd you think? She said, well, when we first came in, we didn't think we were going to learn much because we've worked in this big garden center for years. And she said, we were amazed at how much we learned. And, and then they took that back to the garden center. And, um, you know, and started to go to native plant conferences and started to build their knowledge further. We also have in extension, you know, we're not, it's not just the horticulture environmental angle. We have a financial, um, uh, financial um, volunteers too. We have 4-H volunteers. We have master food volunteers. And we have, um, you know, nutrition people. And so some of our volunteers go on to uh, be other volunteers within Extension. We have one that's the president of our association, and he's taken the Master Gardener training, and now he's a Master Food volunteer too. So, you know, just equipping people to know what's in their community for volunteering is, is a good thing for that Extension does. You know, th there are just... Other people, um, what, that guy who's a landscape architect, when he came to our class, he really didn't know plants and plant disease as much, but he sure knew a lot about design. Now he's, uh, he, and he was with this really, you know, expensive design firm. And after he took the class, he said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he went to work for uh, Anacostia Watershed Society and helped with that restoration project. And now he's training uh, stormwater volunteers up in Maryland. Um, and he's gonna be um, adding a design component to that. So, I mean, you know, it, the sky's the limit, um, it, but, and it's a, it's a good basic um, education on horticulture. Absolutely. And I love how you talked about how it took him a different direction. Um, with everything that you're doing, especially with uh, Prince William County, uh, could you sort of speak uh, to what's been the most rewarding part about your job and how have you sort of been able to take that moment? And I don't think mimics the right word, but uh, maybe repeat it throughout your career. Um, that, and again, creating more and more opportunities for the community members here in Prince William County. You know, that's a, that's a great question because I, and I, hands down, the best thing is the incredible volunteers that come and the diversity of volunteers that I get. They come from so many different backgrounds with so many different skill sets. And the most rewarding thing is having that light bulb go off. And even though they might have been working in a high level government position all their life, now they're ready to do something a little different with a different part of their brain. And, and 
and finding that place where that volunteer shines and where that volunteer learns a new thing and then can teach it to another person is, is the best thing. Just these are wonderful people, wonderful people that want to give back. And that's absolutely the best thing about my job. That's fantastic. Um, in order to go with the last point, uh, I should have asked this first, but um, you were talking about how you work with uh, master uh, food masters in different areas of extension. Um, have you guys been able to make connections where maybe you're working on so- something, say like a vegetable garden or something that then can be taken with other extension, uh, again, food masters and work together through the extension like organization and then develop even more for the community in a way, if that makes sense. I'm sorry. Yep, it, it does. No, it does. Yeah. And, and I think we're getting better at that. Um, we, we have done gardens at community centers and then the, uh, the master food volunteers have come in and done a cooking class. Uh, to follow up with that. Um, Or we've done a lesson on um, eating five vegetables and we've done a pizza garden. Um, Or um, actually we've done some classes on gardening for the uh, financial education. Um, You know, we'll flip in and do a quick little seminar on doing a container garden especially, you know, that would be applicable to somebody that was still living in an apartment or a smaller community. So we have done that. And certainly 4-H there, um, we participated in, in um, a lot of their activities, um, either at the, either at a club level or at a, you know, at a higher level um, in the community. So I used to be a 4-H leader too, um, for natural resource projects when just after my kids were grown another great organization Um, oh yeah uh, we have quite a few kids i believe that are part of it so it's great um with extension and everything uh i think virginia tech plays a big role in that obviously um could you sort of explain how virginia tech is a part of uh again something four hours away or three and a half hours away uh here in prince william and how has that relationship benefited what you are trying to accomplish here with the master gardeners? Yeah. And it's not just Virginia tech, it's Virginia state. Virginia state, right. Yeah. Gotcha. So uh, Virginia state gives us a, a wealth of information on um, uh, particularly garden I mean, uh, farming. And so a lot of it is ap- applicable to, um, you know, agriculture in our county, which Thomas is our agriculture agent, Um, but also um, Virginia Tech is is a great backup for us. I always tell the class, I'm a generalist. I I know, you know, not very deep about a lot of topics, but I always know that if I have a question that I have the specialist of Virginia Tech backing me up. And I, I use the example often about when I, I think I was only there in the office four years and I, I really knew nothing about growing grapes <laughs> and somebody brought a grape leaf in and it looked a little funky and I kind of peeled it open and, and found an, a critter in there and took some pictures. And then I said, well, I think it's this, but I'm going to call our viticulture specialist, our grape guy. And I sent him pictures and he said, yep, you got it right. You you guessed right. And um, here's the best control for that. And I knew that I was getting the best research-based information. It wasn't, you know, a guess. It wasn't just me searching the internet. It it was the best research to be had in Virginia on growing grapes and what that pest was and how to treat it. So I always know I have got Mike Goatley. I have Tony the viticulture guy, we have all the fruit growers. I mean, I don't have to know everything. I just need to know where to get the, get the right, accurate research-based information. Yeah, so you kind of already touched on this a little bit, but can you speak to the Master Gardeners community that you have developed and how has it created an impact in Prince William County? 
Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think their their um, diversity of projects that they're involved in, and and the fact that they're citizens of the community anyway, so people know them, and then you add this layer of being an expert in horticulture as they get more competent, and and so that um, that that extends our reach even more. You know, that's where extension comes from, extending extending the reach through our volunteers to the whole community. And, and I, I know this isn't quite what you asked, but I also see it as a, we're a cohesive group now. We support each other in a lot of ways socially, especially during COVID. You know, people were looking out for each other. They were leaving plants out for each other on the end of their driveway. And I think, you know, being a caring community of volunteers, you know, we're not perfect. We've got grumpy people. <laughs> We've got people that don't pull their own weight. But for the most part, we're a caring community that cares about the community at large, but we also care about each other. And I always tell my volunteers, you came to volunteer for the knowledge, but you stay because of the relationships. You stay because there are other people you care about. You know, that's just caring about the projects and the learning isn't enough to stay with the group. Absolutely. And I, I love how you said it's, it's more than just that, especially with COVID and it sort of being the year anniversary and thinking back to when it was, hey, I'm going to leave it at the end of your driveway. Um, <laughs> it really, it's incredible to, to hear. Um, you sort of talked a little bit about the different areas in which you are, are sort of educating your students on. What area are you most intrigued by and how have you sort of uh, developed that love for the specific area? I guess, you know, it's hard not to just love the idea of what Doug Tallamy and um, bringing nature home and talking about, you know, the importance of native plants, native trees, native shrubs on our ecosystem. And I, I think that you know, that's the passion that most of the groups we collaborate with have too. And I, I, that probably is the thing I'm most passionate about is making sure people understand the importance of choosing the right plants and not choosing things that are exotic. And um, we're trying to get the county to only buy replacement plants that are native in the future. And it's like pulling teeth. But that is my passion, and I'm, uh, you know, I hope to see that in my lifetime. That that people choose um, at least seventy percent native plants in their yard. Well, let us know how we can help you with that. Uh, Great, we've got, we've got a lot of a lot of kids. <laughs> we've got over two hundred kids to help That's spread neat. that word. So yeah, let us know if we can help in any way. Um, sort of a little shift in the idea. Um, could you speak to how our students, if they're curious in sort of the same, not the same, but a position and extension, uh, how would they go about doing that? And more specifically in the horticulture uh, sort of area that you are working in. So you want to know how your students could get involved? So either involved or pursue maybe a career in it one day. Yeah. You know, the Master Gardener program um, manual is identical to the certified horticulture specialist for Virginia, NVLA, uh, Northern Virginia Landscape Association test, except for the NVLA test has more parts. It has some design, some marketing, and it also has some tree and shrub ID. And so, you know, the Master Gardener program, some people jump from the Master Gardener program and then get their their um, certification through NVLA, which is it is not a bad path to take. Um, you can kind of do it in steps then. Um, so that would be one place. You know, my boss, um, uh, Paige Thacker, she's a horticulture agent. She started uh, at Tech and then she went and worked at R Riverbend Nursery uh, right outside of Blacksburg and she worked in the propagation. And that that is another excellent a path to take to, um, to learn about plants from the start 
to the to marketing them. So I think that's a good way to go. I don't think there are many landscape firms right now that I would say that was a good path to work with. I mean, they might be, they might be working you hard and you might be learning how to dig a hole, but you might not be learning the best techniques. The because a lot of landscaping that's done is not done properly. So the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals Certification, that's not a college level, that, that would be appropriate. Learning to inspect stormwater structures and what plants go in rain gardens. And um, I would recommend that as a path too. Those are all non-college paths, but you know, certainly there are many college paths too. Way too many college paths, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm the what you were talking about, sort of the propagating part and sort of the development to marketing. We actually do that in our program. We develop. Um, we have so in the fall we sort of do uh, a mum sale, and we sometimes get pansies, but we do like the basics with everything. Teach them how to water properly, maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually just got a brand new state of the art greenhouse. Um, it's incredible. And we've been long overdue with that. So we were very excited to have that. But we do everything from seed, propagation, all the different aspects. Uh, and Mrs. Beard is our horticulture teacher at Brentsville. And she's been working on it. We're a little bit behind this year because of COVID. And we didn't get back in the building for, I think it's the fourth week now. And we started mm -hmm. about a week or two before. But we do all that. And then we try and... Uh, put the, the plant sale on the kids and being able to serve the people that come in and want to order stuff and sort of tailor to them. And again, develop those relationships at a young age so they can better understand clientele and different areas of marketing, putting out information and all that. So again, I, I, I appreciate how you said that. We, we try to, we aim to do that here. So um, we do appreciate that. Um, well, that is really neat. Got I'm, I just want to congratulate you guys for, for, for doing that. You know, that cheers me so much to hear what great training you're providing. Guys, you don't know how good that you got this is. I'm <laughs> so pleased to hear this. Good job, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we try. And again, we just try and put our kids in positions to, to better prepare them for the industry, whatever industry they're interested in when it comes to the green industry. Um, but again, with all that, um, we just aim to, again, grow industry leaders from here at Brentsville. Um, shifting again, sorry. <laughs> um, what are your future goals moving forward? Uh, and how do you see everything moving forward past COVID? Um, especially because, again, like you said, it has had a huge impact. Um, the other thing is you see some of the things that have been adopted during COVID sort of continuing on into uh, hopefully what is the normal world, please, Lord, please. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna be moving ahead slowly um, and carefully. And I think we'll keep up a lot of the virtual stuff, honestly, because it's been so successful. Um, and, but we'll, we won't do it to the exclusion of live stuff, which probably means we'll be working doubly hard. <laughs> but that's you gotta love that, right? <laughs> we want to reach people, and you know, sometimes you just gotta do it to reach people. So those are the, but but proceeding slowly, carefully. There are a lot. A lot of our volunteers are vulnerable. Um. And so, and you know, making the training better every year is really my goal. Is there is there any goal like you said with uh? Fairfax, there's sort of a diversity uh, that you said they have. Is there any other like areas of the program that you want to grow on? Or uh, well, again, you said make better. Just is there anything past that that you're interested in doing? You know, I, I, we have some advanced master gardener training and um, it, in one's land care, in one's uh, uh, forestry, and one, one is water stewards. I, I'd like to see those, uh, and some of those um, train the volunteers to be policy makers and program developers, you know, as much as just volunteering to work. And so you know, that's the next level up. And I, I've honestly never had the energy or time to do that much, 
but I, I think I would I think I would like to see that develop more in the future. So if there was were anything that you could tell yourself at the start of your career to help you throughout it, what would it be? <laughs> That's a great question, Mara. Oh. You know, as a little kid, I really, really liked the dirt, much to my mom's dismay. And I really liked bugs. And I, and you know, if I, I don't regret having a different career, but I'm really back to who I really am being in this job, you know? So look to what you, your passion is now when you're young and, um, and, you know, maybe that's just your, going to be your hobby. Maybe, you know, maybe, but, but always retain that possibility that you could um, do what you love because that is such a tremendous asset in this world. Not many people love what they do, but it's, it's wonderful to be in a place where I'm supposed to be doing what I love and what I'm supposed to be doing. So, you know, I, I consider that a, such a privilege. Absolutely. Um, with sort of everything um, and sort of, again, you've been speaking to it and I, I love it because it's really great for our kids to hear um, sort of moving forward with everything. And this doesn't have to deal with monster gardeners or anything, uh, horticulture, anything really. Um, what would be any words of advice you could give our kids moving forward, sort of entering the world? And again, through your story, you've obviously explained right now, do what you love. And, and, and that's a really, really big part of what we try and teach here. Um, what other words of advice would you give our kids um, moving forward, sort of that, that entry point into the world in a sense, right out of high school? You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is my mom said, um, you know, competition is out there, but if you're good enough, if you're good enough at what you do and you strive for excellence and, and you have a good work ethic, then you're going to be successful. And I, I used to be so mad that she said that because it made me strive all the time to do that. Uh, but, and I see that in my kids too, you know, my kids are just overachievers, <laughs> and, but, but that is what's made us, um, you know, successful at what we do. And we don't make a lot of money, um, but we do do our jobs well. And, and that's, that's something that is a real sense of uh, pride, you know, and you'll, you'll be able to know you've done your best, know you've done a good job. Darn my mom. <laughs> well, you got to love mothers. They, they do everything <laughs> for you, you know? Yeah. I, I know I wouldn't be anywhere in this world without mine. So that's for uh -huh. sure. Um, again, I want to thank you so much for all that you do for our community here locally. It's incredible to see. Um, and again, at, if, if we can end any way, shape or form to get involved, if you need help volunteers on top of the volunteers, uh, anything, please just let us know. We would love to be involved. Um, uh, we're readily available once COVID restrictions are <laughs> no longer a thing. Like you said, moving forward slowly, um, and cautiously, obviously, um, uh, what do you guys say? Thank you. Thank you. You guys, it's so nice to meet you, even if it is virtual. Keep up the good work. You too, Andrew. And, you know, would love to collaborate with you on something. And, and I know that my two coworkers would love to have a chance to talk with your students too. We, we will definitely reach out and make that happen soon. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Happy to do it. Thanks a lot for inviting me.